Good afternoon. Welcome to EPI online and to this discussion of the new book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Uh, this book is being lauded as the most comprehensive case to date for economic reparations for U.S. descendants of slavery. And I'm honored to be joined today by the authors of From Here to Equality, uh, William A. Darity Jr. and A. Kirsten Mullen. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Glad you so to be here. Um, I am Valerie Wilson. I direct EPI's program on race, ethnicity, uh, and the economy. And I will be moderating our discussion today. Uh, before we get started, I want to uh, offer some brief introductions. I've mentioned um, briefly the names of our authors. William A. Darity Jr. is the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African American and African Studies, and Economics at Duke University. A. Kirsten Mullen is a writer, folklorist, museum consultant, and lecturer whose work focuses on race, art, history, and politics. Now, those are the formal introductions, uh, but I know our speakers as Sandy and Kirsten. Uh, Sandy is my former grad school professor, professor uh, dissertation advisor, and actually was the person who conferred my doctoral hood on me when I graduated from grad school. And Kirsten and I also share a connection being that we both come from the same hometown or, of Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> So uh, the three of us have a bit of a history, <laughs> uh, but honestly, they are two of the smartest and most down to earth people that I know. And their unapologetic commitment to justice, dignity and economic empowerment of black people uh, has not been an inspiration to me uh, professionally, as well as to many others, I'm sure. Um, a few reminders before I turn things over to Sandy and Kirsten. Uh, towards the end of this event, we will take questions from the audience. So if you have questions, we're asking that you please uh, submit those by typing into the chat box or using the Q&A function. And we'll try to answer as many of those as we have time for. Uh, we're also asking people to use the hashtag uh, from here to equality. Uh, if you want to share insights uh, or links or, or continue the discussion beyond this event. So with no further delay, I am going to turn things over to Sandy and Kirsten to talk a bit about uh, the book, as well as uh, some of the issues that have come up, some of the questions, common questions that have arisen since they've been on their virtual book tour. So Sandy, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that really sweet and generous introduction. We really, really appreciate it. That was lovely. Um, I want to thank you uh, and Thea Lee of the Economic Policy Institute for this invitation, invitation to engage in this conversation. Uh, we are so grateful for the essential assistance of uh, economist uh, Jacoba Williams, uh, the organization's uh, communication team led by Eve Tamming Siogu, together with Antonina. Uh, Richera, Richeri, and Kirsten Flood. Um, and then thank you to all of you uh, who are joining us here today. I would like to begin with a passage from the introduction of our book, From Here to Equality, uh, just released from the University of North Carolina Press. Right. From Here to Equality draws a thick line from the nation's origins to the present. Uh, we thank Jack Fisher for this rich description. Um, the case we build in this volume is based on all three tiers or phases of injustice, slavery, American apartheid, Jim Crow, and the combined effects of present day discrimination and the ongoing deprecation of black lives. Most advocates of black reparations have focused exclusively on the injustice of slavery as the basis for redress. Law professor Boris Bitker argued that the case for reparations should center solely on the harms of legalized segregation, while Roy L. Brooks, also a legal scholar, has argued that the foundation for black reparations is, quote, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow, end quote. 
We submit that the Bill of Particulars for Black Reparations also must include contemporary ongoing injustices, injustices resulting in barriers and penalties for the Black descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Sociologist Joe Fagan catalogs the continuing injuries inflicted on Black Americans, including wage penalties, physical and psycho-emotional health wounds, and community and institutional damages. Despite the Brown v. Board of Education decision of 1954, a wave of federal legislation in the 1960s and 1970s intended to eliminate legal apartheid in the United States and the enactment of anti-discrimination laws, Blacks continue to bear the weight of American racism. The burden, that burden is manifest in labor market discrimination, grossly attenuated wealth, confinement to neighborhoods with lower levels of amenities and safety, disproportionate exposure to inferior schooling, significantly greater danger in encounters with the police and the criminal justice system writ large, and a general social disdain for the value of Black people's lives. The legal apparatus created by the civil rights revolution does little to address the complex web of harms imposed upon Black Americans today. Taken individually, any one of these three tiers of injustice, slavery, the regime of legal segregation and subordination, and current discrimination makes a powerful case for Black reparations. Taken collectively, they are impossible to ignore. So I'd like to um, uh, continue by outlining several arguments that have been raised in opposition to reparations. One of those is a charge against what we and others refer to as slavery reparations. Slavery is indeed the fulcrum from which the grievous injustices we cite that constitute the case for reparations for Black American descendants of slavery flow. Uh, Black people were not admitted to full citizenship when slavery ended, and they are not members of that club today. Um, in chronological order, the charges we make are against slavery, legal segregation, Jim Crow, white terror, and ongoing discrimination and, and stigmatization. The case we're making for reparations is based on all three of these injustices, not solely on slavery. Okay. So our process, uh, the first step, which is actually ongoing, has been relearning American history. Uh, we are not we were, we were not well versed in the systemic work we are calling dismemory, organized projects aimed at forgetting or distorting the nation's history. Uh, in 1866, immediately after the Civil War ended, the Ku Klux Klan was founded. Uh, throughout this period, uh, Reconstruction, uh, some arms of the Klan literally wiped out individuals whose recollections of recent events differed from their own. That same year, According to the Encyclopedia of Virginia, the term lost cause first appears in print with the publication of the lost cause of new Southern history of the war of the Confederates by uh, was written by a popular editor of the Richmond Examiner named Edward A. Pollard. And then the term also was immortalized in a poem by that same name, which is accessioned by the Library of Congress in 1872. So the aim of these efforts, efforts was to mask the Confederacy's role as secessionists and traitors who lost the war. Okay. Uh, the largest sustained spike in dismemory or active forgetting, these activities happened between 1900 and 1920. I mean, basically the 50 year mark uh, celebrating the anniversary of the Civil War. Um, monuments were placed in public spaces, courthouse grounds, uh, in schools, streets, military bases, cities, uh, bearing these officers' names, uh, lobbying for Confederate holidays begins. At least seven states, including North Carolina, honor their defeat today. Over 1,500 such monuments existed in the United States in 2016. The top six, Virginia with 223, Texas with 178, North Carolina uh, with 174, I think, uh, sorry, that's Georgia with 174, North Carolina with 140, uh, Mississippi has 130, South Carolina, 112. But deep into the 20th century, the facts of enslavement and the early and sustained efforts of Black abolitionists were suppressed. What we see instead is the rise of the Daughters of the American Revolution and the persistent and ongoing efforts of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which was founded in 1894. Um, they raised money to erect monuments, uh, over 700 historical markers to the lost cause um, you know, were created. Uh, this is according to the Washington Post. Um, they also conducted genealogical research and documented the lives of Civil War veterans, 
then they lobby the states to create um, archives that would become repositories for these men's stories. Uh, historian Jacqueline Dow Hall writes about how these middle and high wealth white women also pressured school districts to replace their community's history textbooks with pro-Confederacy tomes written by authors sanctioned by the UDC or written by UDC members themselves. Uh, these textbooks romanticized the cause of the Confederacy, depicted Blacks as servile, happy-go-lucky creatures whose highest aspirations uh, were doing the bidding of their owners 24-7, and even omitted the voices of dissenting whites. So uh, another historian, Charles Dew, was born in 1937 and is the author of the fascinating and disturbing memoir, The Making of a Racist, a Southerner Reflects on History, Family History, and the Slave Trade, wrote about being given a copy of A Youth's Confederate Reader uh, by R.M. Smith, uh, published in 1951, when he was a child, and then being quizzed about its contents and significance. Um, and then the last example I want to give at this point, uh, Ethan J. Keitel and Blaine Roberts' terrific book, Denmark V.C.'s Garden, Slavery and Memory in the Cradle of the uh, in the cradle of the in the south, cradle of the south, which was published uh, in 2018. Uh, so VC, of course, is uh, was the literate black carpenter and former slave who purchased his freedom with his winnings from the lottery. Um, uh, he attempted to uh, purchase the freedom of his family, but was denied that opportunity. Um, and soon thereafter, he and his conspirators uh, plan what ultimately uh, is a failed rebellion in 1822. Um, BC has ties to the African American Episcopal Church that becomes Mother Emanuel uh, in Charleston after the Civil War. Um, so the planters believe, this is um, one of the things that, uh, that Kittle and, and Roberts tell us, as the, the Charleston Mercury newspaper posited, quote, the issue before the country is the extinction of slavery. So in the moment, the Confederates were very clear about what uh, what the reasons were for engaging in the Civil War. It's, you know, their supporters subsequent to the war who muddied and, uh, you know, reordered, reconstructed uh, those memories. So um, I like to talk, uh, Sadie, so I'm going to talk about some additional examples of this memory that we address in our book. One of the central themes of our book is that uh, organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy have crafted a systematic disinformation campaign about America's past, particularly with respect to the Civil War and the Reconstruction Era. And uh, we've, we've emphasized that we think about the case for reparations as extending beyond the period of slavery, but it's, it's important to recognize that the effects of slavery still extend into the present moment. And this is largely because in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, there was a failure to deliver to the formerly enslaved the promised 40 acre land grants as restitution for their long period of bondage in the United States. And had such restitution been provided, we think or we speculate that we may not have a need for the conversation that we're having now about reparations. And uh, what I'd like to do in the remaining time is talk about some specific examples of the disinformation campaign. And these are examples that we hear in conversations that we currently have, both in terms of conversations that are in social groups, but also conversations that appear on social media. And one of the first of these is the argument that, well, there really weren't that many people who owned slaves in the United States. There really weren't that many Southerners who owned slaves in the United States. I've even heard the statistic advance that only 2% of Southern Americans were slaveholders. So this is one of the issues we address in the text and would like to share what we say in the text with you. In 1860, at the national level, approximately 8% of all American families owned at least one slave. But this seemingly low aggregate national percentage was influenced heavily by the 21 northern non-southern states where no families owned slaves during the last days of the antebellum period. 
By 1860, the Southern experience with slaveholding stood in marked contrast with the Northern pattern. Among the 11 states that seceded from the Union in 1861 to establish the Confederacy, Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, Texas, and Louisiana registered at the lower end with at least 20% of white families owning slaves, 20, 25, 26, 28, 28, and 29% respectively. The remaining five states all registered proportions of 34% or higher, peaking at staggering rates of 46 and 49% in South Carolina and Mississippi respectively. A still more dramatic indicator of the scope of white engagement with slave ownership is the proportion of white people who were members of slaveholding families. While the national figure was 13%, in 1860, one quarter of whites in Arkansas and Tennessee lived in families that owned at least one slave. In Texas, Virginia, and North Carolina, at least one third of whites lived in slave owning families. This proportion rose well above 40% in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana, cresting at a fantastic 55 and 57% in Mississippi and South Carolina, respectively. In the Army of Northern Virginia, led by Robert E. Lee, soldiers who either owned slaves in their own name or lived in families whose slaves were, where slaves were owned constituted almost 40% of the enlistees. Because of backward and forward linkages from the slave plantation system, arguably the majority of Confederate soldiers had economic ties to slavery at least as renters or uh, of land from, or employees of, or traders with slaveholders. More than half of the officers were slave owners. At the onset of the Civil War, Southern whites and slave, inter, in, slave ownership were intertwined tenaciously. Uh, in one of the footnotes of, of our book, we actually address the claim that, uh, that we've actually heard that the majority of slave owners were black. Some people have made this assertion. Well, this is a, a flat out lie. Uh, and and uh, in one of the footnotes in our book, we make the following observation. Um, let, me, let me find the exact page. Okay. Uh, page 313. Page 313? Yeah, 313. 313, yeah. Uh, okay. So in, in the footnote on page 313, we report on what the actual data says. Slaves held by free blacks comprised a tiny proportion of the total number of enslaved persons. The best available estimates indicate that 3,000 free blacks owned 20,000 people in 1860. Approximately 0.05% of the 4 million enslaved persons. The 3,000 slaveholding Blacks themselves constituted less than 1% of the 477,000 free Blacks in the United States. Uh, the next argument that we'd like to address is the, uh, the, the observation that many people make that there were uh, 600,000 Americans who gave their lives during the course of the Civil War and that that sacrifice constitutes reparations for black Americans. Uh, we would suggest that there's a number of reasons that that's a, a vicious argument. The first is uh, half of that 600,000 are individuals who fought for the Confederacy to preserve slavery. So that the mortality out of that 600,000 that's relevant to soldiers who fought to end slavery is closer to a figure of 300 to 350,000 persons. Moreover, out of that 350,000 individuals who died in the course of the Civil War, we have to count the mortality that was associated with the contributions that were made by black soldiers. There were actually 180,000 blacks who served in the Union Army and their rate of mortality was actually higher than the rate of mortality among white soldiers. So the, uh, the process of liberation of American Blacks through the Civil War 
was not exclusively a gift that was bestowed upon black Americans by white Americans. It was a process that black Americans contributed to in large numbers, including blood for the purposes of, 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 of freeing or freeing blacks and ending slavery. Um, I would add further that actually the Civil War didn't have to happen. That immense loss of life didn't actually have to take place. In chapter five of From Here to Equality, titled Alternatives to War and Slavery, we discuss the numerous overtures that were made to the Southern slaveholders to accept a proposal for compensated emancipation that they would be paid to free their slaves instead of having the massive conflict that led to the greatest loss of life in the history of the nation on this soil. Um, and then a, a, a final observation we'd like to make in this context is the ending of an atrocity like slavery is not the equivalent of the provision of reparations. If you end the atrocity, it's what Malcolm X would have described as pulling the knife out, but it is not what he would have described as healing the wound. So you have suspension of the atrocity via the Civil War, but you do not have compensation for the damages that had been occurred, incurred by the many, many years of slavery. So we want to make a distinction between sub, sub, suspension of a harm, suspension of atrocities, and uh, an actual compensation for the harms of the atrocity. Uh, final uh, example that we'd like to share today of the disinformation campaign is an argument that's frequently made that American Blacks have already received uh, reparations in the form of welfare payments okay, and other types of social programs. And so I'd like to turn to the passage in our book where we, we discuss this claim. Uh, so I think this is page 246, am I correct? Yeah. So we write the following. Ironically, when those social programs were first introduced in the 1930s, and this is under the aegis of the New Deal, they were structured to exclude Blacks from their benefits. Blacks did not get full access to the nation's social safety net until 1965, three decades later. Moreover, America's social programs were never black specific initiatives. In fact, excluding blacks from agricultural and domestic household, from excluding blacks from the benefits were, uh, were designated as uh, agricultural and domestic household workers which were occupations that Blacks held in disproportionate numbers at the, at the onset of the New Deal era. The majority of Blacks actually were employed in those occupations at that point. And it was the exclusion of agricultural and domestic household workers, which was one of the conditions that congressmen from the Southern states exacted in exchange for their support. Preventing these workers from educational opportunities and higher paying jobs protected the Southern way of life. It has also never been true that the majority of re recipients of federal benefits are Blacks. And political scientist Ira Katz Nelson has demonstrated that when the GI Bill was introduced at the aftermath of World War II, the legislation that provided the greatest boost for social mobility for all Americans of any legislation that has been adopted. Uh, the GI Bill was designed in such a way to exclude Blacks. So that in the state of Mississippi alone, of the 3,229 GI Bill guaranteed home, business, and farm loans made in 1947, only two went to Black veterans. And we conclude this section by saying, this extreme disparity in Mississippi was virtually preordained. Representative John Elliott Rankin, Democrat of Mississippi, who served 16 terms 
was a principal architect of the GI Bill's exclusion of black beneficiaries. Rankin demanded that the bill be a matter of local control and states' rights. Counselors from the Veterans Administration guided black veterans towards vocational and trade schools rather than colleges and universities. Furthermore, counselors didn't merely discourage black veterans, they just said no, no to home loans, no to job placement except for the most menial positions, and no to college except for historically black colleges maintaining the sham of separate but equal. Finally, eligibility for benefits is mean tested. Only families or individuals living before, below the poverty line are deemed eligible for support. America's solution to this problem does not prevent people from falling into poverty. Rather, it provides them with limited assistance only after they have already become poor. Moreover, these programs do not address nor were they intended to, intended to address the group-specific injustices directed at Black Americans across the span of the nation's history. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think you both have done a great job of sort of laying out the case and putting a few stakes in the ground um, for the continuation of this conversation. Uh, we've already started to get a lot of good questions uh, from folks who are joining uh, in this event today, but there are a few questions that I'd like to follow up on uh, with both of you uh, to get your responses from. Um, first of all, I think that your pairing on this project is unique uh, in that you are coming together to write a book about reparations from the perspective of an economist, but also a fol folklorist and historian. Uh, now, I personally uh, often have said that, you know, when we're dealing with issues related to race, it's almost impossible to really address the issues and make a complete case from just one perspective or one discipline. Uh, I'd like to get your take on the importance of storytelling in making this case for reparations. Uh, you've mentioned some of the issues around this memory and this information uh, that were used uh, following reconstruction and the Civil War, but why is storytelling and, and putting together a complete historical narrative uh, so essential to making a case for reparations? You know, I think a big component of history is story, is narrative. Um, there are many different forms that it takes um, whether you are looking at, you know, journals or diaries that were created by individuals who lived through specific moments in, uh, in the past, or if you're talking about newspaper accounts uh, where reporters gathered information from folks who were on the scene or reactions of people who lived elsewhere but were made aware of what was happening uh, in these places of concern, places where they had family members possibly, who, um, you know, who were experiencing the war or who had financial interests. Um, we've always needed, I think, a personal connection to help us, uh, you know, begin to see how, you know, how these incidents uh, affected us. You know, what was the significance for us as individuals? Um, I actually had a, a, a personal uh, moment myself uh, early in the writing of uh, From Here to Equality uh, I was speaking with a woman who, um, you know, was aware, I think, of the work that I did, but really had not had an opportunity or uh, to to read any of it. And she saw me making some notes on one occasion and asked me what was I doing. And I explained to her that this was part of this project, um, you know, to look at America's history through um, a, a different lens, and that we were uh, making this persuasive art, this persuasive argument for. Uh, reparations for Black Americans in the United States, Black Americans who are descendants of, of American slaves. And so she said, well, read, read some of that to me. So I was, you know, kind of startled, uh, but, but agreed to do so. And I, I turned to, 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 to see her face as I was reading. And um, almost immediately, you know, her brows were knitted and she was, you know, uh, had this really puzzled expression on her face. And I said, um, uh, Gia, what, what's, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she said, you know, I'm, and I'm just paraphrasing now, this is some years ago, uh, we had this exchange. She said, you know, I'm familiar with the words that you're using, but I don't understand how you're using them. Mm 
And so I said, well, what would make a difference? What would what would matter? What would help you to 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 you know what would make this story what, this is a narrative come alive for you? And she said, I need a story. I need a personal story. Um, as it happened, we had just met Hortense McClinton, uh, who's a black woman who um, uh, is herself the daughter of an enslaved person. Her, uh, she is alive today, 101 years old. Uh, we just saw her in October of last year. We had just met her uh, and interviewed her, and, uh, but we hadn't transcribed that conversation. I went home that night uh, was up all night long, like five or six hours, transcribing uh, the, the conversation uh, I had with Hortense McClinton. Rewrote this section, this was a section on uh, responses to the critics uh, of reparations. And I emailed uh, uh, Gia in the night and said, you know, can we get together and talk about this again? And she agreed. And I read the portion to her and she said, that's it. You know, that that makes sense to me. And it's, I was so relieving uh, Hortense McClinton's story, her family's story about how they were living in um, Northeastern Texas. Um, her, father, um, her father's family was in the lumber business and they were very successful, uh, but their success and their wealth was very conspicuous to local whites. And they actually had to get out of town uh, for their own safety and they moved to Boley, Oklahoma. Um, and so at that moment uh, of seeing uh, her expression, uh, uh, Gia's expression, we went back and rewrote the book. We started over and said, we need to, we need a different way of thinking about this uh, so that we can bring as many people into this conversation as possible. Yeah, it's a long-winded explanation, but that's. I, I, I just wanna add a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, one of our missions or tasks is to craft an honest record of American history to replace the dishonest record that has dominated uh, teaching in our schools, dominated the national conversation. The second thing is, uh, in the example that Kirsten gave of, uh, of Ms. McClinton's family, and her father having to leave his Texas home and move to Boley, Oklahoma. It's characteristic of a general pattern of the seizure and appropriation of black property and the destruction of black lives that took place frequently in the form of enormous massacres during the course of the period from the end of the Civil War up through the 1940s. Uh, the most notable examples are probably Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, and Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. But these occurred on a, a massive scale continuously throughout that entire period. Ms. McClinton, I will say, makes, made the point to us that um, the main reason that the Black community in Boley was not also a target um, by vigilante whites they kept their own militia 24 seven and every family had a responsibility for standing guard. And they were very aware of what had happened in Tulsa, but they were prepared. Yeah, a lot of the um, feedback and response that you get when we bring up reparations um, often you know, can be very negative and nasty. Um, but I want to read uh, one comment that was written in response to a recent op-ed uh, the two of you wrote for Newsweek in talking about how COVID-19 really lays bare <laughs> the reason why we need reparations in the United States. And I thought that this sort of take on things was interesting. I just want to get your response to, to this quote. It says, quote, what we need is for these politicians and race hustlers to stop trying to constantly divide people on skin color. We have millions of successful black business owners, black millionaires, black billionaires, black celebrities, black legislators, black governors, black congressmen, members and senators. And we were the first majority white country on planet earth to elect a black president twice. And that was 12 years ago. I think it's safe to say that a black person can achieve any dream they have in America. There is no country in the history of humanity that has done more for black people than the United States of America. And there is no country on planet earth that is better to live in or offers more opportunities 
for black people than the United States of America. What do you say to that? Now, I know there was a lot there. <laughs> We're doing great. There. What are we complaining about? <laughs> well, you know, the phrase that the United States has done more for black people than any country in the world is, uh, is, is somewhat stunning. I, I guess I would be more inclined to say maybe the United States has done more to black people than any other country in the world. Uh, but apart from that, I, I think the overall premise is that there are all these examples of black success that are interpreted or yeah, these examples are interpreted as an indicator uh, that black folks are doing well in the United States. Uh, but uh, if we look in a very careful way at what uh, the data tells us about the lives of average or ordinary so-called black people, uh, the examples of these celebrities are far, far outliers. Uh, and they are not a demonstration that there is a, a, a general pattern of, 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 of well-being among Black Americans. Uh, you know, one of the things that we focus on heavily in the text is the idea that a reparations program should be designed to eliminate the racial wealth gap in the United States. And um, that, that gap is so staggering that any claims about individual celebrities like Oprah Winfrey or LeBron James are, are fully eclipsed by what the, the, the story is for, for most black people in the United States. So black Americans are about 13% of the nation's population, but only possess about 2.6% of the nation's wealth. The average black household has $800,000 less in net worth than the average white household. And, and I would add that with respect to these celebrities, uh, their levels of wealth really are not comparable to the wealthiest white Americans either. Uh, in fact, I think 25% of American white households have a net worth in excess of $1 million. It's only 4% of black households. So there's this, this glaring chasm that's associated with health differences, with differences in employment opportunities, with differences in the capacity to provide quality education for your kids, with differences in the capacity to provide a significant endowment of resources to the next generation uh, that accumulate over time and maintain the kind of rupture in opportunity and capacity between black and white Americans that is uh, a striking characteristic of this society. So, uh, so I think our response to this individual is that they are actually misled by focusing on outlier instances of black success without focusing on what the typical experience is of both black and white Americans in the United States. I think too, the, the flip side of this outlier um, data, um, four white billionaires have wealth that approximate that of 80% of all black Americans. So it's, a, it's a, you know, when you look at it, you know, that look at it that way, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the reality is much more stark. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree The the data and the facts really, you know, help to make the point and are really very clear and very striking. Um, I think the fact that reparations itself is such a divisive issue in many ways helps to make the case for why we need uh, reparations. The fact that there is such a visceral reaction to the idea of making black people more economically equal or you know, giving black people money in, in any sort of format. People have such a negative uh, reaction to that. Um, I'm curious, what do you make of that kind of reaction? Why is that so offensive to people in light of the clear uh, data that shows that there is a gaping uh, racial wealth gap in this country? And even when we can talk about uh, there being uh, 10 times more wealth uh, in white households than black households, even that misses the fact that there are many more who have zero or negative <laughs> net worth. 
yet people are extremely opposed and come up with all kinds of reasons for why uh, this is something that's unreasonable, something that we can't do. Um, what, what do you make of that kind of reaction in the face of very clear data and information? I think one of the, the points uh, that we're trying to make is that people don't know this data. This data is not widely held. Um, and certainly extremes are not widely known by blacks or whites. Um, I, I remember, um, you know, talking to, you know, uh, white friends, especially uh, on the early, uh, during the early days of Occupy, um, many of these individuals who perhaps imagined they were part of the 1% who were shocked to discover that they weren't even close. Um, you know, I don't think that we talk about money, let alone wealth uh, in a way that, um, you know, makes it common, you know, a common knowledge. We don't, we don't have this common understanding of uh, where we all sit. I think it's precisely for that reason. At the beginning of chapter two of the book, we have an extensive discussion about what people appear to believe about uh, the, the economic status, the health status, the educational status of blacks and whites, uh, the relative status. And, and we show based upon a uh, couple of major surveys that both whites and blacks have a tendency to overestimate the conditions of black life. Uh, and so then we proceed in the remainder of the chapter to confront people's beliefs with what the actual data looks like. Uh, but I will say this, it, it's not clear that you necessarily change people's minds when you present them with better data. Uh, they frequently will engage in an act of cognitive dissonance and, and deny that the data that you present them with is valid because they are so wedded to their prior beliefs. But those prior beliefs, we think, arise out of the effectiveness of the dismemory project that we have talked about. And so it's, it's not only critical to provide people with uh, the most accurate data about the economic status of all Americans, but also to provide them with the more accurate narrative about the nation's history because otherwise they will continue to take the position that the kinds of disparities that we're observing must be due to some kind of dysfunctional behavior on the part of black Americans, rather than being a consequence of the entire chain of structural conditions that have been, uh, have been crafted by the nation's uh, trajectory of racial injustice. I want to turn now to some of the questions that have been uh, submitted online. There are several really good questions here, so I'm going to try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, one person asks, what would be appropriate reparations to those eligible, and how would you determine eligibility? Can you speak to some of the specific specifics of your uh, plan? So we have two criteria, two main criteria uh, for eligibility, and we uh, uh, reparations would be um, uh, reparations would be a target for Black American descendants of uh, people who were enslaved in the United States. So one would have to have self-identified uh, 12 years prior to the enactment of uh, legislation or a program, uh, a study, uh, and deliver reparations. Uh, would have to have self-identified as Black, uh, African American, or Negro. So those two criteria. So demonstrating that you are a descendant of a black person who was enslaved in the United States and that you have self-identified as black um, African-American or Negro 12 years before the onset of a reparations program or the enactment of legislation. Now, we, we set the 12 year limit because we thought that would be long enough to preclude people declaring themselves to be black, Negro, or African-American in anticipation of the benefits of a reparations program. All right, uh, the next question. Uh, what do you consider to be the ultimate goal of reparations if they are actually granted? 
It is, is it an acknowledgement of the human rights crimes by the US and payment for those crimes? Is it to give black people the capacity to shape their future or is it something else? So we say at the outset that we think that there are three objectives of a reparations uh, project. Uh, the first is acknowledgement, which constitutes the recognition on the part of the culpable party that a grievous injustice has been committed and that the culpable party in some way, shape or form has actually benefited from that grievous injustice having been committed. The second thing we, we say is, a, uh, is an objective of, uh, of a reparations project is, is redress, which is uh, not just pulling the knife out, but actually healing the wound. And healing the wound can be accomplished by acts of restitution. And historically in the context of other examples of reparations programs, that restitution has typically taken the form of some type of monetary payment to the victimized community. And then the, the third aspect of, uh, of a reparations project is what we call closure, uh, which is the, uh, the mutual agreement on the part of the culpable party and the victimized community that the debt has been paid and that the victimized community will make no further claims on that particular set of injustices unless a new wave of those injustices occurs or an entirely new set of injustices occur. Um, so the next question, uh, reparations is a loaded word, often shutting down a conversation before it can start. How do you recommend easing into this conversation, especially with white people in power? Read our book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was an easy answer. Um, what else we have here? Okay, so... What are some of the current policies recently adopted that you think continue the legacy of racially biased policies and practices uh, that you mentioned, Dr. Darity? Uh, you know, uh, the current existing policies that perpetuate these kinds of disparities. I mean, well, you, okay, okay, I'll start. Uh, I mean, one, one could say that the, the, uh, the absolute failure to actually address these conditions is a policy decision in and of itself. So what we might call preservation of the status quo, uh, keeping things as they are. So it's actually the absence of active interventions to address the situation that perpetuates the situation as it is. But there are also other types of injustices that we've talked about that are associated with this post-Civil Rights Act era uh, that would require perhaps different types of interventions to address. So one of these is, um, you know, as, as we've witnessed uh, only yesterday, uh, is, the, is the sustained pattern of police executions of unarmed Blacks. Uh, not at all clear that reparations will stop that, but there needs to be social policy to address that. Um, and then uh, another example is discrimination in credit markets, housing markets, markets for employment. And that of course requires anti-discrimination measures. Although a reparations program can play an important role in compensating for past instances of discriminatory practices. Uh, but I, I think it's actually the absence of intervention rather than newer policies that are, are that heavily contribute to these conditions. Although, uh, let, me, let me add this, uh, certain types of programs that are supposed to be addressing poverty are done in such a way that they actually aggravate inequality. So our CARES Act, for, for example, uh, is intended to try to uh, mitigate some of the worst 
uh, worst effects of the current economic depression, which is produced by the health crisis. And the CARES Act in the way in which the funds are allocated simply increases inequality and particularly racial inequality in the United States. I wanted to mention too, I mean, just the historical uh, act that was not fulfilled was you know, the delivery of 40 acres, uh, 40 acre land grants to the newly emancipated slaves. You know, had that, um, you know, had that measure been carried out, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, you know, but that was kind of, you know, one of the early moments when, you know, Black people's hopes were riding on uh, this opportunity to start their lives anew and to have, you know, um, you know, to have some, uh, you know, a nucleus of, you know, uh, an asset that they could build upon and also pass on, or importantly, pass on uh, down the generations was never, was never fulfilled. And that, that took place at the same time yes. that uh, 160 acre land grants were given to a significant number of white Americans in the Western part of the country. And those 160 acre land grants are what the president of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis calls free equity. So when people are talking about handouts, I mean, this, this is perhaps the most dramatic instance of a set of handouts and they were racialized handouts. Uh, and so uh, while blacks are not getting the 40 acres, whites are getting 160 acre, acre land grants. And uh, I think the uh, historian Carrie Lee Merritt estimates that there are approximately 45 million living white Americans who are beneficiaries of those land grants that went to their ancestors. Uh, so there is a set of social policies that have created the racial wealth gap, sustain the racial wealth gap. And so we are arguing that a reparations program is the needed intervention to alter that terrain altogether. So we have another question here about the title of the book and why you chose the word equality rather than equity. Is there a particular significance to using the word uh, equality in an age of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we chose equality because we want to eliminate the racial wealth gap. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, you might argue that if equity was the objective, uh, for a number of reasons associated with the entire weight of the historic damages that have been imposed upon Black Americans, uh, we might want more than equality. We might, we might be making a case that uh, Blacks should be given a level of wealth that's higher than the white level of wealth. But since we set as our target elimination of the racial wealth gap, we chose the idea of equality as being central to the reparations uh, program. And uh, it's, it's strictly speaking, our focus is on material or economic equality, but we certainly are aware that there are other dimensions of equality that have to be achieved. And, uh, and that's the reason why one of the things that we emphasize in our version of a reparations project is, a, uh, is an active national campaign financed through the reparations project to address national memory. That is to say, we need to reverse dismemory and that should be an aspect or a critical aspect of, of a reparations effort. So this next question seems like a good follow-up on that. Uh, family wealth is a cumulative result of wealth building from home ownership to business development to investment returns. How will reparations overcome this generational phenomenon? Well, the racial wealth gap is a consequence mm -hmm. of the intergenerational uh, disadvantage in transmitting resources to subsequent generations. So if you directly assault the racial wealth gap, you're doing exactly what the, uh, the questioner is, is, is asking about. Uh, 
you are closing or eliminating the kinds of disparities that are a consequence of the cumulative historical, uh, historical effects of, of past transfers of resources across generations. And certainly the recipients would be able to pass on, you know, all or part of those, uh, you know, those funds to their own family members uh, as they choose. I mean, what we're really talking about is a situation in which the wealth position of Black Americans at the household level is increased by at least $800,000, and the wealth position of individual Black Americans is increased by anywhere from uh, $200,000 to $250,000. Uh, that's a very different world from the world that we're living in, and uh, we are eager to see how that would play out. All right, so uh, I think we have time probably for a couple more questions. Uh, this is one that always comes up when you're talking about redistributing or spending large amounts of money. <laughs> uh, so what do you say to people who want to know how it will affect the economy or the federal budget? Well, we, we certainly have seen in the last month that the United States has the capacity to pay for such a program. Um, and you know, we have seen uh, this relief uh, package uh, to the tune of $2 million rolled out without tax, uh, any tax effects on, uh, on the populace. So we know that either through the US Treasury or through the Federal Reserve, uh, we have the ability to, um, to create a reparations program for Black American descendants of folks who were enslaved here. Um, we just need the will to do it. Um, you know, there's ample moral um, evidence for such a program, we need to have a, a groundswell of people in this country say, yes, this needs to happen and now is the time. The federal government can, can find sufficient funds to spend for virtually anything it desires uh, without being constrained by, uh, by its tax base. What, what is at stake, and that this is something that we do have to be alert to uh, in, the, in the course of executing a reparations program, and this is something we talk about in the book, uh, the, the real barrier to ex expanded federal spending is the potential inflation risk. And so a reparations program would have to be crafted in such a way that the funds are allocated to individual recipients uh, in, in such a way that we mitigate the inflationary effects. And so this may involve having to distribute the allocation of the funds over uh, uh, several years. We've talked about eliminating the racial wealth gap in a decade. It, it may mean providing people with an endowment where they're able on an annual basis to spend uh, out of the interest on the endowment but only conditionally make use of the principal on the endowment. There, there are strategies in which you can mitigate the inflation risk and also close the racial wealth gap. But it's not a question of the federal government not having the money. So I think we're gonna close on uh, this point, your, question, your answer to, to this question that I think captures several of the strings here in the, the questions on the chat. So you clearly put a lot of thought and time into writing this book and developing a blueprint for reparations. Um, so I think it's safe to assume that on some level, you believe that it's possible at some point to get this done. Yeah. Um, what do you think it will take to make the idea of reparations a reality? Are there things happening now that give you some reasons for hope? Are there particular people or proposals or examples that you think could, you know, sort of be a little groundswell of action to get this moving forward? So at the start of this century, the year 2000, uh, Ravana Popoff and Michael Dawson did a survey that indicated that, and this is a staggering statistic, 4% of white Americans endorsed reparations for black Americans. Uh, fortunately, that number has actually risen. And so today that proportion is closer to 20%. And, uh, and our impression is from looking at the data 
that uh, close to half of all millennials actually endorse reparations for black Americans. So there is a different climate that makes it possible for a greater degree of receptiveness. Uh, we also think that uh, one of the tasks of our book and other, uh, other research projects that are correcting or attempting to correct the, the dismemory narrative uh, is, is hopefully going to have the effect of moving more people in the direction of supporting reparations. Uh, we think that there's a legislative initiative that exists now that's important. HR 40, the legislation that is supposed to activate a study commission to make the case for reparations and to design a program of reparations that can be translated directly into congressional legislation. There are some significant weaknesses in that legislation. It needs to be revised and rewritten because it hasn't really been changed significantly since it was introduced in 1989. Uh, but, uh, but that's, that's an important stepping stone. Uh, and then the, the last thing I'll mention, and Kirsten may have something to add here, is that uh, we think that the way in which this movement can be built is through the formation of a consortium of communities, organizations, and the like that uh, feel a sense of obligation to address these historical wrongs. And so our local uh, mayor, uh, Steve Shule, has actually asked our city council to take the lead in forming such a consortium to, uh, to petition Congress for uh, a national program of reparations. And I would say too, uh, in this moment of the pandemic, as more of us are being made aware of the comorbidities that have uh, that have uh, contributed to the high, so just disproportionately high numbers of uh, Black people uh, and Native Americans who have been negatively affected by the virus and who have died. Um, the wealth gap is one of those comorbidities, right? Um, so in addition to all the, the disparities in health, we have the wealth gap. And so, you know, I don't think it's something that people necessarily thought about. You know, they would list, you know, um, uh, you know, heart disease, um, diabetes, um, uh, severe respiratory syndrome, but they don't think about this historic problem of the wealth gap. And I think the more, uh, uh, as, as it's mentioned, you know, in this kind of this heady stew of, um, you know, problems that, um, you know, that we have in this country, you know, people will begin to think, oh, you know, this is something that's been happening for a, going on for a very long time. This is not a recent phenomena. And that's part of the work that From Here to Equality is trying to do, you know, to demonstrate that these patterns are as old as the nation itself. And, um, but once again, we have an opportunity to, to take a different path. And we are encouraging, you know, uh, everyone to rethink, you know, who we are as a nation and to make a dramatic, uh, you know, be part of this dramatic effort to change who we are going forward uh, by pushing for reparations for Black Americans. And I think that is a perfect note to end on. I uh, want to say thank you again to Sandy and Kirsten for sharing this hour with us and sharing this labor of love, which is your new book, From Here to Equality. Um, I want to thank all who have joined us online, and I encourage you to go and get the book. As a matter of fact, once we end the meeting, you will be redirected to the page where you can place your orders. Mm -hmm. And for news on any upcoming EPI events, you can visit epi.org backslash sign up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, EPI. Yes, thank you so much. We're very grateful.